Legends and Losers is sponsored by Oracle NetSuite. Check out netsuite.com slash legends. Today, our guest is Richard Bronson. He's a real wolf of Wall Street, and he's going to share what it feels like to be the king of the world on Wall Street. Get busted. Pay it all back. Do your time and then become an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur now who is committed to helping other ex-cons get jobs. All right, all right, all right. Joy Ramon said, hey ho, let's go, and that's exactly what we're gonna do. Hello, my legendary friends, and man, do we have an episode of Legends and Losers today. An entrepreneurial story of redemption uh, in the biggest, most powerful way, and um, I've been incredibly, incredibly inspired by Richard Bronson, so inspired that I've actually made an, an investment in his company. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, if you're uh, a longtime listener of Legends and Losers, namaste. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate that you hang out with me and um, you know, so does the rest of the team behind the scenes. And I'm always curious, you know, are you at the gym now? Are you out for a run? Are you in your car? Um, are you listening at work when you really shouldn't be because you got boring stuff going on? Um, are you doing chores? Are you mowing the lawn? Are you like me sitting in the garden petting one of your chickens? <laughs> That's where I like to listen to podcasts. Anyway, wherever you um, enjoy Legends and Losers, I'm just glad that you do. Now, if you're new to Legends and Losers, I hope somebody told you. This is not your typical interview show. Um, if you think about the typical interview show, it's a, I think it's a worn out paradigm, candidly. Because what happens is you get a professional host and a bunch of producers and they have a prearranged narrative they're trying to drive. They have pre-built pre questions and so forth. And they edit the crap out of the show. And they only give you, you know, the, the value bombs or whatever that is they think that you want to hear. And with the guests, typically highly accomplished people um, have some kind of a media training. They have a PR agent. And so they get trained how to deliver their pre-configured talking points. And the host has their pre-configured narrative and questions. And what most of, when you listen to, I don't mean to pick on anybody, but, you know, if you listen to an NPR podcast or something like that, or, or most business podcasts, that's what you hear. It's the, it's the collision of a pre-configured narrative and a bunch of talking points. And it's, it's all hacked up and edited and spooned and fed to us. And I just think it's inauthentic and it's mostly crap. Um, that's not what happens on Legends and Losers. We're what you could think of as a dialogue show. Two people sitting down over a beer, a coffee, or on a walk and doing what people used to do, which is look each other in the face and have a real conversation. And that's what we aim to do. We believe one real conversation can change your life. And if it doesn't change your life, it can certainly make your day better. And, and candidly, I also think there's something warm and wonderful about the natural arc of a conversation. And so we try to have real dialogues about it, what, it, what it takes to design a legendary business and a legendary life. Today, we have a super special guy. And, you know, another reason we're called legends and losers is sort of this idea that you can't be a legend without being a loser. And sometimes we flip back and forth again. And, you know, Richard admittedly did the wrong thing. Um, but interestingly enough, he owned it. Uh, so I'll get to that in a second. Now. Um, our friends at NetSuite want to help you grow your business. And um, if your business is not in the cloud, I want you to think about it, or I'd ask you to think about it. I actually think, I was thinking about this the other day, talking to some friends. Cloud technology is underhyped. Now, you may think that's crazy, but um, if you believe what my uh, partner on Play Bigger, Kevin Maney, says, or what the incredibly smart venture capitalist Duncan Davidson, also a guest on Legends and Losers from Bullpen Capital says, both of them believe similar things, which is we are at a time of explosive innovation that is very much like what happened in the late 1800s, heading into the early 1900s, where we got the automobile, electric light, ultimately um, um, the industrial revolution and so forth. So if Kevin and Duncan are right, we're at the greatest time in history to be starting or building a business. And yet in America, the statistics around business failure and business starts are terrifying. And so our friends at NetSuite are really 
um, the platform for growth for new companies from the garage to the IPO and beyond. And if, if, if I'm right in believing what Duncan and Kevin say that this is the greatest time in business, then what's required is a platform for growth in the cloud. And that's exactly what um, NetSuite is. They allow small growth oriented companies to kick incredible ass to, 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 to create new uh, niches and categories and to scale to scale revenue and to scale globally. They operate in almost every country around the world. And as you know, you know, just dealing with currencies can, can crush you. And so um, it's the platform for entrepreneurship. And I believe entrepreneurs are the people with the courage to slay the cynicism of our time with their dreams. And so if you're not on NetSuite, I'd ask you to consider is now the time to replatform on NetSuite, a complete business management system for every aspect of your outfit in the cloud. You can run your business with a bunch of dashboards on your smartphone. You have this Star Trek communicator on your phone that you can run your business from. It's incredible. With NetSuite, you can save time, money, and headaches by managing every aspect from sales, finance, accounting, orders, inventory, HR, and more. Visit netsuite.com slash legends. And when you go there, what you're going to be able to do is set up a time to talk with a NetSuite expert in growth in your industry. At NetSuite plays in almost every industry vertical. And you'll be able to talk to an expert about barriers and opportunities and, and new ways to turbocharge your growth for a free consultation for an hour. Visit netsuite.com slash legends. All right, Richard, Richard Bronson. I, I find this guy so inspiring. And when I take a step back, who amongst us, you know, it'd be very easy to be judgmental of a guy like Richard, big ding dong on Wall Street, making tons of money. And um, like some people of that era in the uh, 80s and 90s, um, or in the 80s rather, um, you know, behave badly. And I don't know about you, but I am far from a perfect person. And I think uh, forgiveness and redemption are incredibly powerful things. And I got taught some stuff about convicts and in particular, convicted murderers by my friend, Will Little. Um, and if you haven't checked out the Will Little episode of Legends and Losers, it's episode 86 and I believe 87, um, then I'd ask you to do that. Because if, I had told, if you had told me that I was going to be friends with and admire and want to support uh, a man who was a convicted murderer, um, not that long ago, I would have told you that was not possible. But Will is somebody who's paid his debt as best he can and is trying to do good things in the world. And what Richard has taught me is that's true for a lot of ex-cons. Um, the other thing is over 90% of people in jail in the United States are going to get out. And here's the scary thing. Nearly 80% of them will end up back in jail within five years of being released, according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics. And our guest today, Richard Bronson, says that's in big part because they can't find work. And if you remember the Will Little episode, when he got out of prison, um, his old world, if you will, jumped on him. And it would have been very easy for him to have a gun and drugs and get back into gangs and doing bad shit. And it took a lot for Will to resist that. And uh, getting a job was almost impossible. So Richard wants to fix that problem. Let me tell you about his background. In the 80s, he worked on Wall Street at Lehman Brothers and Bear Stearns. He ultimately became a partner at Stratton uh, Oakmont, which is the firm featured in the movie Wolf of Wall Street. He went on to found his own firm, which eventually grew to around 500 people. And in Richard's words, they were, quote, up to no good. He was eventually convicted of securities fraud. And then Richard and his partner did something truly legendary. They stood up like real men and they owned their mistakes and they repaid those losses. And as a result of doing the right thing, he was sentenced to 22 months only in a federal prison. Today, Richard is an entrepreneur. He had this big aha, like all legendary entrepreneurs have, which is that most people in prison, when they come out, have this huge challenge and they are not as advantaged in some cases as Richard was. And so he wanted to do something to help good people coming out of prison who've redeemed themselves uh, and, and want to be on a good path, 
get jobs. And he started a for-profit company called 70millionjobs.com that helps people with criminal records get work. Now, um, they've already helped hundreds of people land legitimate employment and they're just getting started. And as a very cool thing, they have, uh, by the time you hear this, it'll probably be live, launched an ICO, an initial coin offering. And they are using blockchain technology to raise money and to incentivize companies to hire good people who previously had criminal records. This is incredible stuff. It's incredibly inspiring. Richard is awesome. To learn more, if you want to participate, uh, like I did, I made an investment in Richard's business. So I want you to know that. I was so inspired by what's going on here. I put my money where my mouth is and I put some cash into Richard's business, 70 million uh, jobs.com. If you want to do the same thing, you can go to 70 million, all one word, coin, C O I N.com. Now, here he is, the incredible Richard Bronson. What's the recidivism rate in the U.S.? Do you know? Yes, I do. Uh, it's really mind numbingly depressing. Um, there is almost an 80% chance that someone who has left jail or prison will be rearrested within five years. Um, two, uh, uh, excuse me, one third of those, uh, excuse me, two thirds of those folks will get arrested within three years. Um, what's stunning is that 90% uh, of those people that have been rearrested will be unemployed at the time of their rearrest. Uh, contrary wise, 90% people, of them, Richard, I'm sorry. I just want to make sure yeah, I heard you right. 90% of the people who are rearrested, which, uh, is close to almost all people who have been released. So number one, it's almost a lock that people released from prison or jail will be rearrested within five years. And 90% of those folks will be unemployed at the time of their rearrest. Wow. Contrary-wise, those people who have jobs are almost never rearrested. So there is a strong direct correlation between employment and short-circuiting the pernicious cycle of recidivism. You know, Richard, I, I, had, uh, I had my eyes open to these realities. And, you know, I'll, I'll admit I, I didn't understand this. Um, we uh, had a, an incredible guy, one of the 10 most inspiring people I know, named Will Little on, on Legends and Losers. And Will grew up on the wrong side of the tracks in, um, in, in Philadelphia and um, you know, ultimately ended up in gangs and ultimately ended up killing a competing gang member and being convicted to 20 years. He got out in 10 for good um, behavior. And he became deeply, deeply committed to making a difference in the world while he was in prison. And however, he shared with me, you know, when you get out, the, the world that you used to be in comes screaming back to you. I mean, and literally in his case, handed him bags of drugs and guns and said, come on, Will, let's go. And so I, I had this personal experience with him of how hard it must be to not get sucked back into that prior world when you get out. Is that part of what's going on as well? Yeah, no doubt. Um, you know, you can take this back almost as far as when somebody's born. Um, you know, uh, there are th certain things that, you know, I don't know you well enough to assume, but my guess would be that there are certain things that you and I take for granted that many people don't and can't. Um, if you're born into a family that's marginally a family by any of the ostensible trappings of family, family done, <laughs> say a father and a mother and a home and people who are gainfully employed and food on the table, et cetera, et cetera, and safe when you walk outside, um, you can't help but be socialized. Uh, and, and, and be born into a context where you see dad going off to work or mom going off to work, where you have friends who are, as you get older, who are thinking about careers, thinking about college, graduating from college and thinking about how do we get a job, 
networking, going online, social media, on and on and on. Um, that's kind of the way I grew up, and that's kind of the expectations that I had, and I was well prepared for what laid ahead. Uh, contrast this with someone who maybe was brought up without a father, uh, a mother who had to work probably several jobs, um, and whose life largely existed on the street, where the only symbols or the only examples of success were people who were doing stuff that you know potentially could get them into lots of trouble and living in a world where you know the rules are of their creation which is to say there are gangs and there's a whole etiquette and protocol and social context that exists for that which is very different than what you what what i went through and probably you as well yeah so so these folks get out of jail and number one, I mean, what's their default behavior? You know, there are things you do that if it's the weekend, that this is what I do. And there are things I do. Well, there are things that these folks do. And if you come out of jail, and even if you have the very best of intentions to go, you know, right the ship and get on with your life in a productive, legal fashion, inevitably, as long as there's an internet, there are background checks which is to say, to a certain extent, you're serving a life sentence that you can't really ever shirk. So you're going on interviews for jobs, quite frankly, that would be difficult for most people to get very, very enthusiastic over. Um, minimum wage jobs at the real low end of the totem pole within an organization. And arguably, that's better than nothing, but truthfully, you know, it's not going to take a family out of poverty, working at a fast food restaurant, and uh, it's not going to, you know, uh, set your imagination afire with dreams of the future. Right. At the same time, you got your friends who are out on the street, and they're having a grand old time. They're getting high. They're hanging out. They're making money. They're flashing their bling. There's girls, all this kind of stuff. Cars, and guns. Cars. How hard would it be for you to go back, you know, there's this two parts, you know, an angel and a devil on either side of your head. One is saying, hang in there, go on your hundredth interview to work flipping hamburgers, or hey man, come on back out here, all your friends are here, we're making a lot of money, we're having a lot of fun, listen to the music, look at the girls. How do you not do that? Honestly, I can't imagine me not reverting to that default behavior. So there's a certain unfortunate inevitability because in truth, these people never really had much of a chance or had very few options growing up and coming out, it's only harder. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, uh, I'll be uh, big enough, if you will, to admit to you that before I really thought about this, and it was Will Little who really kind of put me in touch with this, I had a sense of separation from these people. I've never been convicted of anything. I've never been charged with anything. My interactions with law enforcement center around speeding tickets primarily. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, this has just not been a part of my life. I have no context for it. Um, and so I falsely separated myself. That is to say, that, that couldn't be me. And what Will taught me was exactly what you just said, which is, Richard, you know, the truth is, I don't think there's much difference, if any. Matter of fact, I don't think there's any. Yeah. Because I couldn't, for the first time in my life, Will had me get what it might have been like to be him at 14 or at 10 or at four. And then it, I think he was 18. or so. No, he was a minor. I think he was 17 when he when he shot and killed this other guy. And it was just so easy for me to be separated. Oh, those guys are murderers. They're at, you know, create this wall that says somehow, and I, look, I'll just admit it. I'm better than them. And what my friend will taught me is I'm the same as them. I had a different set of circumstances and under his circumstances, I, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Um, you know, going through, I, I, I myself was incarcerated and did a couple of years in, in prison. Um, and, you know, I, I, it's, it's very, very easy and it's comforting as well 
to um, walk around with the belief that there are absolutes regarding morality. There's right and there's wrong, and there's them and there's us. And I am not a person who's immoral, QED, I don't commit crimes, I don't kill people, I don't go away to prison, I'm better, I'm different, and stay the hell away from me. Yes, and, 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 and the one other thing I'd say is, and by the way, lock those bastards up and throw away the key who gives sure. a fuck, right? For sure. for That's sure. a very easy place to go to in our minds. Yeah, for sure. Well, we're, we, we're fearful of anything that's different f from us or upsets our status quo. But when you go away to prison, and it's not even necessary these days to go away to prison because get this, uh, it's about one in three adults have some kind of record. So one in three adults. So, you know, almost everybody has been touched <laughs> by the criminal justice system. Everybody knows somebody. And what you discover, certainly in prison, where, you know, there's no more artifice, there's no more posing. It's not like on the street where you, you know, playing a role. But essentially, you know, over time, you become a human being anywhere, including prison. And you discover that, number one, there are people there who have committed crimes that there's nobody who hasn't committed the same crime. And by that, I mean, for example, they got behind the wheel and they had one extra beer or one too many glasses of wine. And it just it went bad from there. And inadvertently, they ended up hitting somebody or killing somebody or whatever. And now they're in prison for involuntary manslaughter for 10 or 20 years. And their life is fucked from here on in. So you meet people who cheated on their taxes or, you know, and I don't know a single successful business person who doesn't play little games on their tax returns, who doesn't take a personal dinner and make it a business expense. This stuff goes on rampantly, except when you get caught in the wrong set of circumstances, you end up, you know, paying the price for it. People who are in gangs, this is a very, very, you bring up a very, very interesting thing that is completely counterintuitive and what I learned particularly through my nonprofit work in reentry. People who are murderers are some of the most incredibly inspiring people I've ever met. Number one, they've had a long time generally in, incarcerated, so they have a lot of time to really meditate on life and understand themselves and understand life in general. People in, who commit murders typically are, it's a very kind of unique situation that compelled them to do it. And commonly, it is in a gang where there is some kind of direct obligation. It's not out of malice, it's not because they went crazy, but rather they had an obligation. Maybe the guy killed their friend, someone else killed their friend, or they killed their brother. There is a quid pro quo, and you know, it's just in the animal kingdom, animals kill each other. They don't do it out of anger, they do it because that's just what animals do. And in a situation like this, not that these folks are animals, but there's a strong sense of protocol and rules, and you buy into it, and that's the deal. I have seen, it, the reality of it is murderers seldom recidivate. They generally, unless you are some crazy serial killer, forget about them, I don't know what to do with those folks, but typically speaking, like the guy you're describing, they do it but once. And then you meet them and you are so moved and inspired and you, and you say, you know something? I would have done the same thing. How could they not have given, you know, the circumstances, the odds that were stacked up against them? Well, you know, as Will tells his story, and, and, and Will's not a guy who is sugarcoating it, and Will's not a guy who doesn't own what happened. Um, but uh, look, there's a compelling case that could have been made for self-defense. They were in a gang war. I understand. And he got the other guy. And so, yeah, I do. Uh, look. There is a very big difference between my friend Will Little and a psycho killer, right? right. Jeffrey Dahmer. This is not. Right. And We're not talking point, about that. I never would have thought. Like when Will Little walks in her room, Richard, it's it sounds crazy, but it's like a maybe a, 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 a very high level of enlightened monk or yeah. priest, or nun, or yeah, yeah, some yeah. spiritual, magical creature. Has, and you don't need to know shit about who he is. 
Like if you're in a room and he walks in, what you know is, wow, somebody, somebody special just walked in this room. Yep. Well, these people have gravitas very frequently. That's the word for it. It's almost like looking at the Lincoln Memorial sitting in the chair like that. It has like epic proportions. It's larger than life. And it's very, very true. People who have gone through this and have had the opportunity to think as deeply and as intensely about their lives and about humanity and society, you know, uh, they, they, there's a vibe about them. There's an aura about them and they're incredibly inspiring. What I would recommend to you, my friend, as well as to anybody who's listening to this, there are a number of programs that exist all throughout the country. And these are typically nonprofits that, uh, among other things, will bring you into, and they'll bring executives and presidents and whoever into prison. And some of the organizations have programs where you really get to connect and they have, they have it's all planned out for you really to connect on a human level with people that in a million years you never ever thought you'd ever meet, much less be hugging and sobbing with and connecting on this incredible human level. Um, typically what happens is that the people who come in thinking that they're going to be providing help to the inmates, it's just the other way around. It's transformational for the people who go in because they are connecting with humans who have gone, who've led a life that has been so challenging and left them with so few options that there was an inevitability of how it would all play out. And yet through it all, maintain a sense of optimism and hope and love of other human beings when it could be so easy to be bitter and angry and it's just the opposite. They're almost saintly, some of these people. And I know that sounds crazy because some of these people have done things that you would shudder to hear about but it's not who they are. It's truly not. It's their circumstances that were so wrong and unfair. And when you can, can, when you can see them as a human being and, and you recognize that all of your assumptions, all, the, all of your, you know, your belief system is completely cast asunder. I, I would argue prejudice. This was a prejudice course, that I had from, that I didn't even know that I had. I'd never given it thought. It was just, oh, assholes in prison, criminals, fuckers, whatever you want to call them. And it's not just that. It's also there's a lot of racism that exists there among all of us, among me, among you. Um, you know, most of the people who are in prison and jails, disproportionate number are male, young, and people of color, African-American and Hispanic. And I didn't grow up with a lot of black guys or a lot of Hispanic guys at all. And, you know, I'm, I have my own prejudices and my own beliefs. I, I, I came to realize uh, living with people for a couple of years, you get to know people. <laughs> and they were as good or as bad as anybody else. Right. You know, right. and once you got past, you know, the posing, you know, when you first walk in, everybody's got an act and everybody's trying to present themselves. And, you know, and they have their little cliques of friends and whatever. But when you get past it, and you realize, you know, if I went through that, how would I not have gotten to trouble as well? Yeah, it would have been, yeah, uh, uh, virtually impossible. Virtually impossible. I got in trouble when I had everything going for me. Right. You know, I, right. what, what's my excuse? I had yeah. none whatsoever. I don't know. You're going to hopefully tell me. <laughs> I, I'll tell you. I, I talk about it all the time. You know, I've come to terms with it. You know, I, I uh, if you'd like, I, would you like me to? Yeah, I'd love to hear all about it, Richard. It's fascinating. Sure. Especially well, given where and where you are now in your life. So yeah, yeah tell me all about it. It's, it's been a very, very interesting life for sure. Um, that uh, if it were scripted, you would probably reject the script because it's just so unlikely. Um, I mean, but anyway, I don't know. I do. I, you know, as I've begun to, I, you know, I did a lot of homework on you in preparation for today, as you might expect. And um they really need to make a movie about your life, uh, yeah. particularly yeah. as you continue forward with this new entrepreneurial endeavor. Anyway, I hate to cut you off. Please tell me all about it. Yeah, it's, um, um, I, I, I'm pretty sure I'd be a little too embarrassed for that. But um, um, I grew up, you know, in a middle class Jewish family on Long Island and, you know, went to college and did well and 
you know, uh, I ended up, uh, I, you know, I wanted to make a lot of money. I saw other guys driving around Porsches and going out with pretty girls. And that was the path I wanted to go on. So, of course, where did I go? I went to Wall Street to work. And I worked initially at a couple of very large firms, um, none of which are still around, but at the time they were a big deal. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I discovered much to my surprise, first of all, that, you know, despite the, the, the fact that these were big companies uh, and, you know, uh, you know, ostensibly very legitimate, you know, kind of conservative, you know, they've been around a hundred years. In fact, um, there was rampant lying and cheating and dishonesty and ripping off clients and all that kind of stuff, you know, to make a buck. But in any event, uh, I work. Can, can I just interrupt you for a second? Sure. I'm curious about, you know, take, for example, a firm like uh, Wells Fargo. Okay. That, um, you know, wasn't involved in a typical, you know, hedge fund scandal or certainly wasn't involved in any kind of a Ponzi scheme or, you know, some of them or, or a stock trading thing or some of the more nefarious things we've historically heard in the past. But yet here's one of our America's most storied banks that keeps getting caught over and over and over again for in one way or another ripping off clients. And so, you know, it's not necessarily just, you know, because I think we think Wolf of Wall Street, we think, you know, Gordon Gecko, we think all those things, and it's mostly around traders and this and that. But here's one of our most storied banks that keeps ripping off customers. Yeah, and, and doing it, you're, you're right, um, you know, that, you know, we're talking about retail banking customers who set up savings accounts and IRAs. Right. These are grandmas and regular working exactly. folks and shit. Exactly. And they and and on a on a spectacular scale, creating millions of phony accounts that are charged so that uh, bankers on the branch level and their supervisors get bonuses and receive all kinds of perks for for doing all this. Yeah. So there's a motivation to do it. Um, I w were, I saw, I saw that all around me and, you know, I, it's very hard not to be a little bit jaded, particularly in New York, you know, where being jaded and cynical is kind of, you know, the same thing as, you know, knowing what a good piece of pizza is. Uh, it's something you learn early on and you embrace <laughs> it and you take some pride right. in it. Um, I, I, uh, I ended up, I had a friend who was friendly with Jordan Lampert, excuse me, Jordan Belfort. I have an old friend named Jordan Lampert. Jordan Belfort, who was the president and owner of Stratton Oakmont, a small over-the-counter stock brokerage firm on Long Island. And I had been hearing about how the guys who worked there, the stockbrokers, were making obscene amounts of money. And these were not Harvard graduates these were probably barely high school graduates who could, you know, largely not even complete a full sentence. And yet they were making a hundred thousand dollars a month and more working at this place. So of course, and, and is this the classic picture in our head of the, the young, uh, aggressive yes. wall street hustler? Yes. yes. Well, it was depicted, uh, in cinemagraphic, all, all of its cinemagraphic beauty by Scorsese in The Wolf of Wall Street. Um, that was was that movie accurate? Um, yeah, it, it was largely accurate. Um, listen, not everybody is good looking as Leonardo DiCaprio. And, you know, I don't know. You look like a pretty handsome guy to me, Richard. Well, there you go. So I said not everybody. Some are. <laughs> uh, but in any event, you know, there's a patina of beauty, you know, that 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 is because he's a great filmmaker, but in reality, you know, it's not quite as pretty as that, but largely as it related to the amount of money being made, the drugs, the pandemonium, the kind of, you know, frat boy, you know, on steroids kind of, you know, way of, of, of doing business. That was very, very true. Uh, I worked there and I be ended up becoming a partner there. Um, and I worked there not, not more than a year or a year and a half. Uh, I left there to start my own firm that would be largely based upon the business practices of that firm, Stratton Oakmont. And I grew the firm to, I had 500 employees and I was doing a huge amount of business. And, and, 
and you, you look, I, I, I want to have this conversation as powerfully as possible. You tell me if I overstep my bounds. When you started that firm, was there anything that you were doing that you thought was on or over the line? Yes, I knew it was. You knew it was. Yes, and we in fact, we in fact uh, did a lot of business with Stratton Oakmont. And we conspired together to manipulate stock markets. Um, You know, one common fallacy is that they or us were ripping off orphans and widows. The truth is, I mean, amidst all the things we did wrong, and we and I personally did plenty that was wrong. um, We we didn't deal with orphans and widows. We dealt with successful business people. Uh, We were in the IPO business. And in the IPO business, where at the time stocks could quadruple uh, and more on the day, we had all kinds of stock traders who tried to get involved with their deals and to get IPO stock. So it wasn't quite, you know, us ripping off, you know, people on fixed incomes. Rather, they were wealthy kind of guys who were players themselves for the most part. But any of that. Um, that's a fine detail. And, and am I wrong in remembering this? Not that necessarily it makes it any better, but, uh, you know, we're not talking about a Ponzi scheme here, right? You were creaming shit off the top for yourselves. Were you, is, that, is that how I should a, think a about Ponzi it? Sc- a Ponzi scheme involves taking in money, you know, with the promise of, of outsized returns and paying the early people who are involved from new people who you're making those same promises to and doing, I mean, you know, that's arguably what Bernie Madoff did on a spectacular scale over decades. We weren't doing that. We were the house, if you could imagine the stock market being like a casino. You're playing against the casino and the odds are against you. And, you know, a uh, casino, uh, if you play Blackjack perfectly, the casino has a slight advantage and over time they will win and that's how they make money. Um, And then within that you have people who don't know how to play perfectly and the casino will even make more money from them. Well imagine if you are the casino and you are able to make the cards come up to whatever, you know, pays off for you. That's essentially what we were able to do. We were the market and we could make stocks go up and down. And, uh, you know, if we own this, if we were long something, we would make sure it would go up through creating a lot of demand artificially. And if we were shorting it or we wanted to buy it at a cheap price, we would push it down and then buy it at a cheap price and then make it go up again. And on the other side of the transactions were these, you know, retail investors and these got wise guys who thought that they were going to beat us, that we always beat them. Because we were the house and you can't beat the house. Yeah. So, and, and what does that feel like, Richard? I mean, do you feel like a master of the universe yeah. when you can control, yes. you know, chunks of the stock market? You feel like a master of the universe when you can control a stock market, when you're driving a red Ferrari, when you're a fat, overweight, balding Jewish guy who now has a 23-year-old supermodel next to him in the, in the Ferrari, when you're living at a spectacular mansion on the beach when casinos are sending you private jets to fly to Monaco and, and all over and Vegas and all over the world. When you're bringing 20 of your friends, taking over the floor of a big casino, everyone's calling you Mr. B. People can't do enough for you. Everybody wants to be in business with you. The maitre d' at the, at the restaurant, the hot restaurant, not only has a table waiting for you, but actually wants to come to work for you. On and on and on and on. It's a I mean, you really are the man. You are a business yeah. rock star in the biggest 100%. possible way. 100%. You have political power. You make donations. You know, you have the ability to make other people money in their account. You were very philanthropic back in those days, were you not? I was. Um, uh, and, and it was certainly, you know, honestly, a lot of it had to do with that while I was doing all the bad stuff that I was doing, and I knew it was wrong. Uh, and despite taking drugs to try to make myself feel better, um, despite that, you know, I had still the things that would gnaw at me, my insides, and keep me up at night. 
that knew I was doing wrong, and that's not why I was put on this earth, and that's not why my parents bore me. Um, the only thing that made me feel good was giving away money to charities and dealing with people who work at charities who are typically very, very good, properly motivated people, as opposed to you know, the type of people I was dealing with by day, which were venal, and we were all criminals, you know, call it what it is. Um, I, uh, uh, my partner and I um, felt that number one, at a certain point, we felt uh, that number one, um, we, we kind of were unhappy of what we had done. And uh, not only that, but we thought that the authorities were coming closer and closer to us. And we Could you feel them sneaking up on you, so to speak? Yeah, yeah. You hear about other people who are kind of in your whole cabal who are getting into trouble. You, you know, you sense that questions are being asked about you and bank accounts are being looked at. Yeah, you, you, you pick up on it. Uh, and, and I hate to interrupt you, Richard, but the impression I get is that the way some of the authorities deal with this is they sort of they do their investigation and just bit by bit, they try to tighten the screws yep. until they get you in a corner that you can't get out of. Well, what is that they how did. it felt to you or how did it feel to you? Yeah. I mean, what they, and, and listen, I wasn't Donald Trump on, on the level of importance, nor was I Bernie Madoff on the level of scale at all. Um, so I'm not trying to make, I'm not, I wasn't John Gotti either um, in the minds of anybody, uh, including myself. Um, is that why you thought maybe you'd get away with it? Because you weren't. No, I, knew, I, I never thought that I would necessarily get away with it. I never believed that. Well, so so okay. Well, that's fascinating. So while this is going on, and I the Ferraris the and, would the come. and the whole thing, what's going on in your mind about that? You know that this is wrong. You were brought up by your parents to be a good boy. You, you have morals. You knew the whole time, right? Yes, I knew. Yes. And uh, so, what are you telling yourself to stick handle around your own conscience? Um, it's, you know, it, it's always there, uh, for me anyway, I don't know about others. I, su I assume there are people who are sociopaths who don't, you know, or amoral completely, you know, that, that don't have that gene in them or that molecule that makes them, you know, uh, have a sense of right and wrong. But I, I, I don't feel, uh, we I, I'm not the person to be judging other people. So I only can really speak about myself. And about myself is I knew what I was doing was wrong. I justified it by saying things like everybody does it, or that's the business we're in, or they did it at the big company, and now I'm doing it, and I'm just doing it a lot better and a, and a much bigger scale, and look at all the fun I'm having. And there was a lot of fun, and there was a lot of things that you know you couldn't help but enjoy about it, but I never fully did because I always had that other part of me that said, what you're doing is wrong, and what you're doing is going to end up, you're going to be paying the price at a certain point. And even if you it's, felt that, I always felt that. And I, and I felt that even if it doesn't happen in this lifetime, it'll happen in another lifetime. You know, I just felt like, you, you know, there's, a, there's causality in the universe, there's karma, and I'm going to end up paying the price. That the Lord is going to get you, or whatever version of yeah. the universe or karma you want to call it, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, uh, the only way that, you know, my, my method of addressing all of this angst over what I was doing was to drink and to take drugs and to go from one situation to another seeking stimulation and surrounding myself with people who are doing what I was doing, you know, who weren't going to sit in judgment of me, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it was not a surprise, you know, the, the federal, particularly the federal government who prosecuted their case against me, um, they have unlimited resources and they will take as long as it takes to bring a foolproof uh, case against you. Uh, almost everybody, rather than fighting them in court, almost everyone will settle. And so, so they, they, they almost always win. If they're in your you know, you're, uh, in the, if you're in their sights, you're They're going get down. You. It's just a question of damage control at that point. So, you know, we paid everybody back, which was a good thing to do. Um, so that, Hold on, Richard, please let me interrupt you. So yeah. everybody you stole from got their money back? Yeah. How, how are you able to do that? 
Um, we, with our lawyers and with the uh, s different states that were involved, the state regulators, as well as the federal regulators, we set up, uh, well, first of all, everybody who sued us or brought an arbitration about against us, we didn't, you know, eventually we didn't fight them. We just wrote checks. Um, so you tried to settle with them individually, each individual well, case. We tried, but, the, but there became way too many to do that. Yeah. And, you know, it would have taken 11 lifetimes to do that. So we created a fund that we, my partner and I funded. And we put them out of out of the firm's money, your own money, or how did well, you the fund firm's it? Money was our money. It was okay. Our, he and I own the company, so yeah. it, you know they they were one and the same. Um, but we both wrote huge checks, and uh, we put it there, and we weren't even administering it. It was you know outsiders that you know um, made all the decisions about who's to get the money. It's funny. I ended up going to prison. And there was a guy there who apparently had done business with us. And this guy was as big a crook as anybody. <laughs> and of course, he had done business with us. And then he got his money back. So when I came to prison, <laughs> I, I walked So up even the, the crooks got their money back? Even the crooks got their money back. And if you knew this guy, that, this was a stone crook. And you know, I went up to him and I said, I want my money back. And he was like, <laughs> uh-oh, you know, somebody's fronting me in prison. What does this mean? But then I, I started laughing. But yeah, everybody got their money back, um, so much so that, you know, typically in financial crimes, there's restitution that's owed. And it could be hundreds of millions, you know, Bernie Madoff owned, owes $50 billion or some ridiculous amount of and money. Of course, he's never going to pay it back, right? Well, of course not. Um, um, in my case, I had no restitution at all. And the judge, you know, made a point of saying, you know, we've checked. You have nothing hidden overseas. You didn't bury anything. There's you know, not some Cayman Islands situation nothing. going on. I wish, I wish, you know, people have, I can't tell you how many people said, are you fucking crazy? You didn't stash some money because I could have easily stashed a few million Somewhere dollars. in Latin America, somewhere. I'm with a friend, with a <laughs> whatever. I could have given it to you to hold, you know? <laughs> right. Some of it would be left. Wouldn't it have been if I gave it to you? Yeah, so... Uh, um, I, uh, we could have buried it under my chicken coop. Nobody would have noticed Richard. Exactly. It's, we'd be digging through chicken shit right yeah, now exactly. and, <laughs> and that wouldn't be chicken shit. But in any event, I didn't do any of that. I mean, and maybe I was a schmuck and maybe I should have or didn't, but I didn't. And essentially, so I went away for two years and you know, something There's like a joke in prison. Everybody says they're innocent, you know, right. go to prison, particularly when I went away in 2002, you know, everybody didn't have the internet and certainly in the prison we were in, there was no internet access. So you meet people and they are whatever they tell you they are. And they can tell you it was a mistake or, a, you know, mistaken identity, or they made a technical error or they had it in for me or they don't know the law and I know it better. That's a frequent thing you hear in prison. Um, and, but I was the only one who said from day, I'm fucking guilty. And if they got anything wrong, that's fine. Cause they, they probably missed 11 things that they could have gotten right that they didn't. So as far as I was concerned, I deserved to be there. And on a certain level, I was very happy to finally have, you know, when you're waiting, you know, watching a scary movie and you know, something is coming and that, you know, the anxiety as it builds. Well, they got Hitchcock movies, or they call exactly. them pot boilers, right? It's like every, yeah. and and it feels slow if you watch those, which I I yeah. love those movies. It just is that how it felt for you as the thing yeah. was building and yeah, the it was terrible. I mean, arguably the time, the year or the year and a half prior to my incarceration was worse than the actual incarceration because um, you're waiting for, for the unknown to occur. And, you know, generally you create an image of the unknown that turns out to be worse than reality. And what it, and, and my approach to the whole thing, which was a mistake in retrospect, but I thought that I could keep the whole thing a secret and that I could continue on until I went away. And then when I got out, I can continue on and no one would be the wiser. And of course, you know, the, the ubiquity of the internet now, there's no secrets that anyone has. And then it was just starting to happen. And I, there was so much pressure that I felt 
trying to live this lie and make believe that nothing was going on. And it inf affected every moment of my day, every relationship I had. I, 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 um, I'm a single guy. I couldn't go out on a date knowing that if I got involved with some, somebody, it would end very abruptly and badly. I couldn't go into business with someone be, or do business with someone because I feared that they would find out and the repercussions would be terrible. Um, so I and this is all during that one and a half year period yeah, where you feel yeah. the feds are coming. Well, I knew then they were there, you know, the, on day one, they just showed up and they, you know, I had been working at some place and they not, and they come into my office and they said, you know, Richard, can we talk? And I said, well, who are you and what's this about? And then they pull up like their jacket and they have a badge on their belt and a gun on the other side. And at that point, what I had been waiting for and fearing and, you know, kind of like the roller coaster that's slowly creeping higher and higher and higher until it reaches that point and then it's just going to plummet downward. Well, we, we hit the top of that roller coaster hill at that moment and immediately I said, this is, my, my life's about to change very, very badly right now and it in fact did. Uh, and, and Richard, if I could pause you there. So the feds show up. Was it, how, many, how many agents came to your sure. A man and a agents. woman. And what did they originally, are they come to the reception? Or, uh, I had you, no reception. They were essentially able to walk right into my office, basically. And they said to you, do you remember what their first yeah. words to you were? Yeah, they said, uh, hi, Richard, uh, can we talk? Or is there some place we could talk? And I said, what are you talking about? What, do you, what, do you, what is this about? And they show the badge. And they said something along the lines of, well, as you know, uh, we've arrested or we've convicted a number of the folks that you've been in involved with business-wise, including Jordan Belfort and Danny Porish, played by DiCaprio and Jonah Hill in that movie, and others. And now, you know, it's going to be your turn, essentially. They said it's our intention to bring a case about, against you and indict you. And I said, okay. And they were very, very, very polite. And I will say this from the right away. I'll say that throughout my experience, including my arrests, my court, you know, the, the courts that I went through, the judges that I went through, the uh, prison, every parole, probation, pretrial, the whole thing. I was the prosecutor himself, you know, the U.S. assistant U.S. attorney who, who actually brought my case. I was treated throughout the whole thing with total respect and total consideration and professionalism. I have to say that. Wow. Yeah. They, this may sound like a crazy question, but why, why do you think they were so professional with you like that? Well, um, I think uh, the, first, I think in the federal system, that that's frequently the way they act. You know, there's that buttoned up image of an FBI agent, you know, prim and proper. Um, so I think there's that, you know, they're, they're definitely, they were professional. But I think it was also because when they came to get me, they said, you know, here's the story. And I spoke to my lawyer and my lawyer immediately said, listen, you don't have a shot of winning this, beating this, you know, whatever. And on a certain level, I really wanted to bring closure to this. And I wanted to admit to my mistakes. And I thought maybe if I do this, I can get on my life and feel better and, you know, be the human being that I always thought I was supposed to be. It was meant to be. And, um, you know, they went to me initially and they said, well, we can do this one of two ways. Um, we can indict you and convict you and send you away for a long, long time, blah, blah, blah. Or you can, you know, help us you know, assist us in bringing cases to other, about other people. I go, what do you mean, like wearing a wire? And they said, potentially, yes. You know, to let me know what that, that was what they were talking about. And I told them immediately, I said, listen, I understand what you're doing. And in all due respect, I have no interest in doing that. I don't care if it's going to save my skin. I already feel guilty enough. I, I, I already feel like I wasn't the man I was supposed to be. If I do this, then... I believe I've lost my mortal soul forever. And I'm just not going to add to that because that's something at this point I just could not forgive myself for. And I think they really respected it. So um, you did not want to be part of... A rat. 
convicting anyone else. You didn't no. want to wear a wire. You no, didn't want no, to do no, that no, stuff. No, no, I mean, you know, I, I, uh, you know, to save my own skin. And and honestly, you know, what would they have done for you if you had quote unquote played ball with them in that way? Do you know? I think I still would have been indicted and convicted. I still would have had a felony arrest, but maybe I wouldn't have done any time. And you did two years. Am I remembering that right? Yes. Yeah. And look, I have no idea, but two years in prison is a non-trivial thing to go do, is it not? It is a non-trivial thing to do. Um, there are people who do much longer time in much worse places than I was because this was my first time, because it was a non-violent thing, white collar thing, because I had paid everybody back, because I was not a jerk to these people and I didn't make their job unnecessarily difficult. You know, under the circumstances, I handled myself. I think this is the way they would describe it. I hand, I, listen, I, I committed crimes. I was a bad guy, but I did right after that. I did as right as I could. And at the same time, I had, you know, I wasn't about to go and ruin somebody else's life to save my own ass. I, I, having said that, let me just make it very, very clear. I'm single. I don't have a wife. I don't have kids. And I'm sure if I had a wife and kids, my attitude would have been, you know, influenced by that. Um, you know, because arguably it's the people you leave behind, your family members who really pay the greater price than the person going away. Yeah. So I didn't have to leave my young wife and infant baby right. without a father. So it was easier for me to make that decision than for other people. I don't know what Richard, I Richard, was there, you know, it's very clear kind of learning about you and so forth. You're a very aggressive guy. You're a very results oriented guy. Uh, you're a fighter, you're a warrior in a business context. You don't achieve the kinds of things that you did uh, without having that fighter DNA of one sort or another. Was there any part of you uh, that sort of thought, you know, F these guys, I'm going to fight them. This is, you know, because you see a lot of people who are in these situations who they immediately default to that kind of a position. Sure. It doesn't sound like you did at all. No, I mean, A, I had a good lawyer who kind of gave me the facts of life. Um, and who told me, you know, what I, what the odds of me prevailing in any kind of way at all. But beyond that, I wanted to take my punishment. I wanted to cleanse myself. I wanted, you know, to put, if I could put this behind me, I wanted to pay my dues, you know, and get absolution. I wanted you know, to rise from the ashes and to try again at life a better, you know, more moral way. You know, th those were the, th you know, it, it sounds corny. It sounds dramatic. No, it doesn't to me, actually, Richard. It, it sounds... Um, it's what motivated me, you know? It sounds like a guy, you tell me, who was brought up to have a conscience, to have core values, who fucked up, and at the time where you realized this was it, you decided uh, you wanted to go, if you will, you tell me if these are the right words, Richard, you wanted to go to be the person you thought you were supposed to be as opposed to this, this person you had become. Is that yeah. fair? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, and so what's that first night in prison like? The first night? Uh, yeah, that, that was interesting. Um, um, first of all, as you can imagine, I've always been a terrible, terrible sleeper, you know, suffering from insomnia. And certainly with, you know, all the legal stuff that I was going through and every day call, bad calls from the attorney and every day, you know, bad press and people I knew deserting me, you know, okay, you know, every day was just a challenge. So when it came time to go to sleep every, every night, I had to take, you know, Ambien and I became addicted to that drug. And I was taking a lot of it. And that is an evil, evil, evil drug to get into. And it does all kinds of weird stuff to your mind. So in any event, when I first showed up at prison, um, where I was uh, incarcerated, it was, they had these like big dorm rooms kind of where uh, there'd be a series of rooms in which there might be, uh, there would be double bunk beds and there might be like 20 guys in each room, you know, very, very close to each other. And I walked in there and um, I was immediately assaulted with the smell there. 
and I had never smelt the smell before. And I became, I learned that the smell was that of mackerel, canned mackerel. And I had, I never grew, I never had mackerel, canned mackerel in my life. I never. What, what does it smell like, Richard? It, it, it's like canned tuna fish, except it's mackerel. It's got a very, very, very strong, um, disgusting. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm assuming this did not smell like a wonderful meal being cooked by uh, no. Parisian chefs. <laughs> no, no, the Parisian chefs were off that night. Um, they, th- th- a lot of guys in prison, um, you know, work out, and a lot of guys are also Hispanic, where I was in Florida. And apparently, mackerel, canned mackerel, is part of the diet, and it, it's high in protein. And mackerel are used as kind of a barter, at least in my prison, that if you do someone a favor, if you do their laundry or you do their job or whatever, you trade them for mackerel. Like it'll be three mac for me to do your laundry every week or whatever it was. So they, they're trading mackerel instead of cigarettes or do they still exactly. trade cigarettes? There were no cigarettes, um, but there were cans of mackerel. So in any event, I was confronted with, with the smell and also the noise of just people on top of each other having conversations, some of them very, very loudly. But in any event, does it get quiet at night? Can you actually sleep, yeah. or is there noise yeah, all I'm night? Gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll be there in one second. Okay, great, great. Sorry, they, <laughs> keep they going. Put, they put the new guys right in the on the top bunks of the bunks that are located right by the bathroom, where they have the showers, the bathroom. The lights are kept on throughout the night, and needless to say, guys are coming in and out of there throughout the night. And I'm on the top bunk on this, you know, ridiculously thin little make-believe mattress. And, and, and are you, excuse me for asking, but are you locked in this cell? No, no, You're, it's not you, a cell. You could, okay. I can walk out of this. Well, I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second. Okay. But in any event, they brought me to where I'm sleeping and I'm looking there. And I had already, I had thought for some reason that, well, they will, you know, continue giving me the medication that I had been prescribed throughout and including Ambien. And they immediately told me, oh, we don't do that. We don't give you Ambien. You know, if you need heart medication or if you need whatever, that, that they give you, but certainly not Ambien. And they brought me to where I'd be sleeping, right by the bathroom, right with the lights on, with everybody walking by. And I'm not sure if it's safe in this place. I don't know who these people are. And it's my first night there. And I'm looking at where I'm going to be sleeping and I'm thinking there is no fucking way I am going to have one night's sleep for all the time that I'm here, that I'm never, ever going to fall asleep. And what I discovered was quite the opposite. Once I came to uh, understand that, number one, my safety was not in peril, that it was a very safe environment because this was the level of security it was made it really desirable within the you know, hierarchy of places that you can be. It was, you know, it, you didn't have violent criminals there. You didn't have mental So you health. were not in fear of other inmates doing something to you? No, initially I was, but I, that, I, I, I was quickly dispelled of that fear. And in fact, um, it was a very, very safe place because nobody would want to create an altercation because if they did, they'd be sent to a much worse place. And, there, and what were most of the other inmates in, in your uh, Florida prison in for? There were a lot of white collar guys. Uh, I was in I was in prison with Charlie Kushner, for example, Jared's dad, and I was in prison with. That's fascinating. Did you get to know him at all? A little bit. Um, the white collar guys. Remind me uh, what he went in for. He um, he uh, had was involved with a divorce with his wife then, and obviously he's a very wealthy guy, and his brother in law. Um, his wife, soon to be ex-wife, uh, was going to be testifying on her behalf about his financial shenanigans. So he attempted to blackmail his brother-in-law by, among other things, setting him up with a hooker. And these are Orthodox Jewish people. So, they, as you do, <laughs> yeah. So, so they hook. So he tried to hook hook him up with a hooker that they could photograph, I guess, or whatever. It was it was all over the New York Post, you know, the 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 tabloid newspaper in New York for weeks and weeks and weeks. It was a big story. But anyway, I was there with him. I was there with a U.S. congressman. I was there with the chairman of Rite Aid drugstores. I was there with a bunch of prominent people there. 
uh, Steve Madden, who I knew for years and years, you know, uh, through our just whole circle. And we were involved with taking his company public. He was there. So there were lots and lots of characters there, um, along with a lot of young uh, African-Americans and Hispanic guys who were guilty generally of fairly, fairly low-level drug deals, you know, that, that were federal crimes, you know, so they crossed state lines, you know, importing, you know, you know, 100 pounds a pot or whatever, you know, those were the kind. So there weren't violent people there. There was nobody uh, that was convicted of a violent crime. Not to my knowledge. People in, in prison generally, one of the rules you learn early on is you don't ask people what they're there for. So, you know, I later learned. So it's were, not like a cocktail party in, in San Francisco where the first thing somebody says is, what do you do for a living? <laughs> yeah, no, you don't. Um, there's a lot of that kind of etiquette that goes on there that you, you just have to learn the hard way. Um, they're just things. So you know, never got beat up or never, attacked or. Never close. Never and obviously close. you never participated in beating somebody up or. No, not at all. It, it didn't go on there. Um, and, and to the contrary, uh, I was, I, you know, I was living in Miami for years at the time of my, you know, when I went through all of this, I owned a big nightclub on South Beach. I had a magazine. What was the name of the club? Remind me, Richard. Shadow Lounge. Shadow Lounge. And at the time, it was like the hottest club uh, on South Beach and with celebrities and all kinds of, you know, craziness. And I, you know, I was well known there. I was a high profile guy. So much so that when I walked into prison, it was like I was coming home. Uh, it turned out I knew a few people there. And <laughs> it turned out that a hundred different people would come up to me and either they read about me that I had made all this money or they had been to my club. I had people said, you know, I, I fucked my girlfriend at your club or I used to sell <laughs> drugs at your club or I, I saw this DJ and it was the greatest night of my life at your club and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, in the newspapers it, somewhere, a magazine article, it talked about how like I had earned $10 million a year or something like that. And I ended up doing two years. And I had a lot of people that started calling me 10 for two. In other words, you got 10 years, you made 10 million and you, you got two years of a sentence. They go, I would do 10 for two all day long. <laughs> they to, you know, they had none of the moral quandaries that I had. They just thought it was really cool. So I had, I knew a lot of people there and, you know, I had, I had a fairly high profile. I, I mean, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't Martha Stewart uh, or one of the real housewives of New Jersey, but you know, I had had something of a profile there going in. But in any event... Were, were any of your uh, partners in the same facility? Or I assume they were not, but were they? I only had one partner and he was not. But I did have guys who used to work with me, uh, work for me as junior partners who went okay. on to do other things that they got into trouble for. So they were there. And so you had colleagues as well as people, yeah, of course, yeah, you yeah. knew. and yeah. yeah, so that's an interesting situation to be in, is it not? Well, um, they were there for their own behavior um, that didn't occur at my firm. Uh, they got into trouble on their own. Uh, <laughs> they were blaming. So they, they didn't need your help for that one? No, they, they were resourceful, and I had taught them well, I guess, or, or not well enough to, that they didn't get caught. But yeah, there were a bunch of them there. But I, I just wanted to complete the, the thought about the sleeping. It turned out that, you know, finally, uh, when I got used to being there and I got through my addiction to Ambien, I started sleeping better than I ever had in my entire life there um, because I no longer had any worries. All my fears and trepidations of the future were dispelled. I had nothing I had to think about. I didn't have to worry about earning a living. I didn't have to worry about getting fed. I didn't have to worry about anything. And I didn't have to worry about women. I didn't have to worry about family things. I was just there. And every day, you know, I would work out and I had a job in the kitchen for an hour or two and I would lay out in the sun. And it, it, if, if, let's just put it this way. If there were women there and the food was better, it would have been a hell of a great kind of country club to belong to <laughs> or something like that. Because it was so relaxing, and I was, you know, in a part of Florida that was actually pretty, 
and uh, you know the weather was always good, so it could have been a lot, lot worse. I mean, there are a lot and, of guys who have done much worse the time than me, for sure. And did you read a lot, or yeah. I mean, you didn't have the internet at because it wasn't where it is today. So you read a lot. I yeah, and and not only wasn't it where it is today, but they also just didn't have it available then. Now uh, a lot of prisons and jails do have it available. Not all of them in California, where I live now. Um, CDCR, the California Corrections and Rehabilitation Department, does not have internet in their prisons, which is, you know, kind of crazy. I'm sure they will eventually. I, I think I, that's I, terrible. It is. Well, you know, uh, yes, it, they should, and it would be in their interest to do it. But in any event, what, what, I, what I did was I, uh, I did read a lot. I worked out every day, and I play, I play guitar, so I never played so much guitar, and I practiced, and I played in the, I see you too. And I played in band. We didn't have those nice guitars where I was. Uh, and I played in a lot of bands. And, you know, you kill. And then, and so you then, can play in band. Like, you can actually jam. You have guitars yeah. and amps and drums yeah. and basses well, and they shit. Had, they had a bunch of acoustic guitars and little pickups. And they yeah. did a set. And, you know, you teach people how to play. You play with them. They're, you know. What, I, kind of song, what kind of music do you like, Richard? I am an old hippie, so for example, yeah. the, great, the Grateful Dead is what I like. Yeah. And so that's always been a... So you're jamming dead songs in, in prison. Yes. And, you know, there would always be some kind of events or whatever, and the different bands would perform. So that was a lot of fun. And, you know, I played a lot of guitar. And then, you know, after dinner, typically, um, I had my circle of friends, which were typically the white white collar guys. And we'd sit around tables and we would just shoot the shit and scheme and what are we going to do when we get out and business ideas and give each other shit about whatever and just doing guy stuff. You know, that's, the, you know, these are like middle-aged men. The way, the way I would when I go out to dinner or go out for beers with my buddies, just the, the kind of stuff. The way you did when you were 18 or when yeah. you were in college or whatever, you, you know, you never have that kind of just free time to do nothing and you know and laugh and whatever and then another you know just count off the days and, and let me ask you how do you i know this is a really big word how do you think about the word forgiveness um it's a very that's a big word um I, for me um it's been a central issue of my life since i've been out to forgive myself and um, I believe that almost everybody in my life has forgiven me. Um, I'd like to think that they're proud of how I, how I dealt with the adversity and I did it honorably. Um, I'd like to think that. Um, but what I discovered is that people have an incredibly big heart and, you know, it makes them feel good sometimes to feel like, that they can forgive and that if you give people a chance and if you're sincere and open about everything and that'll come through and almost everybody understands that who among us hasn't screwed up, who among us hasn't needed a second chance or asked forgiveness. And so I have discovered, you know, and I worked in the nonprofit space, reentry space where I used to run big public events and I would tell my story and my story could not be more public right now. I have every week, there's a big magazine article about me or eight podcasts, you know, that go on and I make, I try, I really am relentlessly on, I try to be relentlessly honest about everything because I have just discovered that number one, people appreciate it and I get back really good stuff from it. And number two, um, it's so much more relaxing, to be honest, and, and not have to, you know, maintain, you know, stories and lies and half truths. It, so, it, it takes a lot of brain power to be a high end liar, yeah, does it not? It's true. And as, the older I get, the, the, the less brain, brain power I have. Story <laughs> is just fa as we as we're sitting here, it's getting worse and worse. <laughs> so I have discovered, you know. Um, the work that I'm doing now, uh, I, if I weren't being honest, there's no way I could be doing it and have the support that we've had. So maybe we could go there. I mean, I, I am so deeply, uh, Richard, inspired by your new company. Thank you. And, and, 
A, I love the mission you're on, and B, you're like so many entrepreneurs. You experience the problem. Right. And as you're, because this is the, you know, one of my favorite simple examples, I live here in beautiful Santa Cruz. This is where Jack O'Neill built the O'Neill company. And he's the, he's the inventor of the surfing wetsuit. He just passed away uh, a little while ago, but you know, he's the classic entrepreneur. And if you buy an O'Neill wetsuit, there's a tag on it with a picture of Jack and it says, I'm just a surfer who wanted to surf longer, right? Water's fucking cold. Want to surf longer into the garage I go and I start working with rubber outfits, right? Classic entrepreneur. And so, so what I love about your story is you had the problem. You come out of prison and you have a hard time getting a job and you realize everybody else is in the exact same circumstance. Right. My, my, uh, a hundred percent, you know, and, and even then go, it was very, very tough for me. You know, part of it was just psychologically, it was tough for me to put the past behind, not continually beat myself up. Um, but part of it was objectively a lot of doors slammed in my face. Friends who disappeared, people who f- feared, you know, thought I was radioactive, stay away. As hard as it was for me. Uh, and, and, and am I right? You didn't have any, I mean, you didn't come out with anything, right? No, you were was, not a wealthy man coming out of jail. No, no, I, w- I was much closer to destitute, actually, uh, having given everything away prior to going away, you know, to charity and legal fees and everything else. Uh, I literally had nothing. I had no home. I had no job. I had no prospects. I had no money. I had a sister with a couch. It was what I, my asset. That, that's so when you, your first night out of prison is there? No. Um, I uh, was in a halfway house for two months. That's typical when you go through the federal system. So I was in a disgusting rat hole in the South Bronx halfway house. And I was so the, the cotton count in the sheets was not something they were focused on? Is that what you're telling me? And once again, that French chef was nowhere to be nowhere found. Nowhere to be found. No there. Italian I, chef. <laughs> the, big, the highlight of my entire experience there was that when you would hear the Mr. Softy truck come by and they allowed you out to get a, a shake or a cone, that was like, for the two months, that was the, the high point of the whole thing, the Mr. Softy truck. Wow. In any event, um, I, despite how hard it was for me to get back on my feet, um, you know, I couldn't help but reflect on the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm here. I am a white, uh, you know, college educated man. What about the guys I was in prison with men of color, young, probably didn't complete high school. What chance would they have? And I later learned that they have almost no chance at all. Yeah. Um, I finally, I banged around doing one bad thing after another that just didn't work out. It didn't take, and I ended up uh, discovering and began working at a, at a nonprofit organization called Defy Ventures, DEFY Ventures, which is prominent both in the Bay Area as well as New York. And they train men and women on how to be entrepreneurs so that they can theoretically, you know, run their own business and gain financial independence that way. And, and the uh, name of that organization again, Richard? Defy, D-E-F-Y Ventures, uh, defyventures.org or the nonprofit, and they are one of the organizations that take people into prison, and they take a lot of people, you know, we both live, you know, in the Bay Area, they take a lot of people into prisons, and uh, who have just amazing, amazing uh, kind of experiences there. I I became director there in New York, and was involved, you know, in a lot of things, including job placement, at a certain point, however, I felt like there are all these great nonprofits around the country. They all have amazing people there, and they do a lot of things for the people who are first coming out of prison. But what about people who have been out for five years and 15 years? Who's helping them? Because I still knew that as long as there's an internet and background checks, these people are still going to have pain finding jobs. And insofar as jobs truly are the silver bullet to you know, to, to get rid of recidivism, I thought it was very, very clear. How can I get, what, what's the path to get as many people jobs as possible? I felt like it had to be a for-profit thing because that could expand beyond just local like these nonprofits. It had to employ technology because that'll enable it to, to scale. And lastly, um, you know, I, I, I felt, or I set a goal, let's get a million people jobs. That's, that was, whoops, sorry about that. No, I, I didn't hear anything. Oh, I lost my connection to you. So 
Uh, I still hear you. Do you okay. still hear me? Uh, yeah. So in any event, yeah, okay. I do still hear you fine. Uh, in any event, I launched um, 70 million jobs. And, oh, the, the thing I wanted to mention was, aside from the opportunity to really scale this thing and reach a lot of people, I also want to make a lot of money. Uh, that's still part of... Yeah, so you're an, you're an entrepreneur again. You Yeah, and, and I have a lot to prove as far as I'm concerned that, that I can make a lot of money and do it legally. And, you know, that... that uh, so do you um, feel like the feds are watching every move or not, how do you feel? Not at all. Not no. At all. I don't feel like anybody is. I, I work with lots of governmental agencies and parole and probation offices. I've worked in the federal system. They've given me clearance to go into prisons and out. I can travel internationally. No, I don't feel like anybody's watching me at all. And, uh, and Richard, if I'm not mistaken, you've been, uh, em, you've been embraced by the you know, Silicon Valley venture entrepreneur ecosystem, have you not? Yeah, yeah it's, it's ironies abound here. Um, this, yes, A, the fact that I have a record. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure that um, I'm doing pretty much the only thing I could be doing that would be accepted because they look upon my unfortunate past as being domain credibility and experience, which is highly valued. I know what you're, you're monetizing your experience. Are you not Richard? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so they call it good founder category fit. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, I have domain expertise. Um, but, um, they are the, the, so in any event, yeah, I, I have been, I have been really supported and accepted. Um, we were accepted into Y Combinator which is a uh, probably the most prominent early stage investor and accelerator program in the world. Pretty uh, much. I mean, if you're a, uh, well, often they profile the younger entrepreneurs, but really if you're a yeah. tech, a starting off tech entrepreneur, or even sometimes multi-time tech entrepreneur for a lot of people, that program and that, that uh, investment is, is the, is the Holy grail for their absolutely. startup. Yes. It's incredibly, I don't have no idea how I got in because not only do I have a record, not only was I uh, probably by a factor of three, the oldest person there, I also don't write a line of code. And, you know. Uh, <laughs> you must have been really something in your Y Combinator class, I mean, right? I was kind of like the bumbling old great uncle that nobody wants to like hand the TV remote control because he's going to screw things up. <laughs> Um, and the irony is, you know, um, among all these incredibly smart, young, you know, PhDs from MIT and Stanford computer science people and, you know, that at age 22 have done incredible things, you know, among them, I, I was certainly, uh, I was certainly, you know, an outlier, uh, but they were, they loved the mission in general. But it, it's funny, you know, it's all in context. Among my friends who are my age, they look upon me like I'm Steve Jobs, you know. Uh, so who am I really? Am I the bumbling grandfather? Yeah, that's probably who I am. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, I, I bet there's a little bit of Steve Jobs going on here uh, too, Richard. <laughs> not, not that much. No, I, I, I had to say not that much. But in any event, it was an amazing experience. And we, we have been supported by the VC community regarding investment. And, you know, they love the mission and many of them also recognize the business opportunity because ultimately that's their obligation is to get returns for their funds. And things are going great. We, uh, we have a big community of people uh, who are job seekers who have come to us and we, get, we, we meet them a variety of lots of different ways, but we have a huge uh, number of people in our pipeline and we've begun working with some very large national companies who, uh, for whom we match up this largely ignored talent, this untapped pool of labor, and we um, match them up with companies that have desperate HR needs, typically. So, now, you know, my friend Will Little told the story on Legends and Losers. I think it was Home Depot. I, I might be wrong, but it was a major, um, it was a major corporation where he had sort of gotten through the local management and they, they were ready to hire him. But when his uh, application and CV went up to co corporate, it got vetoed. Yeah. And so I, I, I you know, I got to believe that whether it's a Home Depot or a Coke or a GE or any Fortune 2000 type company, 
you know, what happens when you guys show up, Richard, and you say, hi, this is who we are, and we want you to start considering hiring these, uh, you know, convicted felons? Yeah, um, that's typically sort of the way we present it. And, um, you know, it's it, in the HR world, this is an issue that's becoming more and more front of mind. And, you know, I would argue that attitudes towards people with records are, is, is improving generally because about the only thing Republicans and Democrats agree on is that the criminal justice system doesn't work at all. And, you know, given the fact that there's historic low unemployment, you have big companies who have a desperate need for people. And then within that, you have some companies who really do strongly feel the mission side of it. And they're very, very supportive. Um, we're not all the way there yet. My job still isn't easy. It's tough for us to make a sale, but um, it's, it's happening. And we're very, very excited about the prospects. Um, Chris, um, I, I'm, I've gone a bit over what I expected. Yeah, fair enough. I understand. It's been a great conversation. Is there anything else, Richard, you'd like to, I mean, I got a million questions I still would love to ask you, but. Well, we can continue talking if you would like, because uh, I enjoyed it very, very much. Um, but um, if, if we don't, you know, we can be, re I can be reached at Richard at 70 million jobs.com. The number 70 million jobs, plural.com. Our website is 70millionjobs.com. And if you are yourself someone with a record or know someone with a record, we can help them get jobs if you just reach out. If you are a large employer, we are very eager to talk to you because we can get you some amazing, amazing people. Um, and I just want to thank everybody for being so supportive and understanding and on a personal level for giving me a second chance. So. You know, I thank God for all of that. And, and Chris, I thank you for the opportunity to tell my story. Oh, Richard, it's incredibly inspiring. And I got one other big question, which is, okay, so you've told, told me what to do if I'm, if, if I'm a felon and I want to play. You've told me what to do if I'm a corporation looking to potentially hire this, this, out of this talent pool. What if I'm someone like me, where I'm not necessarily hiring anybody, but I'm somebody who might want to make a contribution to support um, uh, to support these folks as they come back into the world or if they're like already say, in the world? There are wonderful nonprofits that are local, whatever town or city you're in. There are many, many of them that exist. If you just go online and type in your, your city name and reentry program, and you're going to find a bunch of them, and they would th be thrilled to get a donation. They'd be thrilled to get your time that you could commit. And many of them have programs that will take you into prisons. That's really an amazing experience that I'd urge everybody to do at least once. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, every, they, all these organizations could use help. And once again, if you're still looking for how you can do it, contact me, Richard, at 70millionjobs.com, and I'll give you a bunch of suggestions. Richard, have you heard the term sheepdog? No. So it's a term that I believe came out of the military and is used in the military and in law, law enforcement. And I forget who originated, but it's, the concept is that there are some people who are sheep, meaning just regular folks living their lives. Uh, there are wolves who want to do bad things to those sheep. And then there are sheepdogs who try to go out of their way to, um, you know, to, to, to help those sheep against the wolves. And so I can't, you know, maybe it's a corny uh, analogy, but the thing that strikes me about you is, you know, fr from wolf to sheepdog, it's just, it's an amazing thing that you have decided that this is now how you're going to invest your life. And this is the difference you want to make. Well, that's very, very kind. Uh, and thank you for calling me two different animals as a compliment, a sheep and a dog. And, uh, you know, all I'm doing is trying to, you know, trying to save my soul and, and do right, you know, and I, I, I hope so you know, I meant it in the most laudatory way. Of course. I was just, I felt <laughs> embarrassed by, by the praise, quite frankly. I'm, it's not easy for me to accept it, but I thank you so much. And I thank you for having the heart to kind of give people the opportunity to share this stuff. Um, because I'm sure you're reaching a load of people and touching their souls. So good on you too, sheepdog, Chris, good <laughs> on you. Uh, in any event, thank you so much. I gotta go. I got a, I got a big employer that wants to hire a bunch of our people. Go. 
And thank you for your time and to your folks listening. Thank you for your patience and hearing my story. And thank you, Richard. And bless you. Bless, bless you. you too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Wowie wee wow. Richard Bronson on Legends and Losers. Um, we all need a second chance and it is incredibly powerful to see what Richard is doing with his second chance to give so many other people a second chance. If you think there's somebody in your life who would love this episode with Richard, why not email it to them right now? And we would love you. We would love the shit out of you just a little extra. If you shared this episode of legends and losers on social media right now, Heather Clancy and I are working on a new book for you called niche down and it's going to come out this summer of 2018. If you want to be part of the Niche Down Street team and get a preview copy of chapter one, uh, give us some feedback on the book so maybe we can make some tweaks as we finalize, uh, we finalize it. And also help us get the word out. Um, and most importantly, give us a review on Amazon.com. If you're willing to do those things, then we would love to send you a uh, no charge, uh, gratuit copy of the first draft of the first chapter of niche down all you need to do is send email to black hole all one word at legendsandlosers.com put niche down in the subject and we will email you chapter one all right we would like to thank the amazing people at 70 millionjobs.com check them out today helping ex cons get great jobs 70 millionjobs.com equity directory the invite network of entrepreneurs and startup talent exchanging Work for equity. If you're in the if you're in the startup ecosystem, <laughs> go to equitydirectory.com. HarperCollins Instant Classic Play Bigger: How Pirates, Dreamers, and Innovators Create and Dominate Markets. Pick up a couple hundred copies where you buy books today. OneLifeFullyLive.org. Dream, plan, and live your best life. Check us out. OneLifeFullyLive.org. The good folks at NetSuite want to help you turbocharge your business. NetSuite.com/legends. Bixen 2, coaching business leaders to hack the future and produce the material outcomes that matter. Check out Joe and Bix Bixen at Bixen2, the number two, dot com. Secondflightconsultancy.com. Uh, this is the business run by Nick Cullen and his uh, and his band of his band, his band of merry growth hackers. If you want to figure out how to growth hack your way to a whole new place in your business, check out Second Flight Consultancy. Dot com. Speaking of great places for entrepreneurs to check out, the new destination on the interweb, growwire.com. I am pleased to be writing on a regular basis for growwire.com, and we're trying to do something special. We're trying to be substantive and fun and illuminating and the new place to hang out on the internet, and we have incredible written content. We have a television show. We have a podcast. Go check out growwire.com and the good people at the World Wildlife Fund. Check out WWF.org because uh, we only have one planet and animals matter. All right. Today's information is provided to you solely for informational purposes. This podcast is the sole property of the Legends and Losers Oddcast Network. And we would love you just a little bit extra if you shared the shit out of Legends and Losers. Now, we must remind you that all rights do remain disturbed. Uh, Legends and Losers is clearly not for wankers. In the event of a boring business conversation, take two Legends and Losers and tweet us in the morning. Remember, be nice to your mother. Don't forget, we all could use a second chance from time to time. Be a podcast hero. Tell two people you love about two podcasts you love. Help them use their smartphone. Get them subscribed. Help them get set up. Don't be lame. Get out of the passing lane. I want to be sedated. Support your local entrepreneurs and buy only pasture-raised, free-range eggs. Thank you, Dandy Candy. I love you, Mom and Dad. Love you, Carrie. And don't forget, this oddcast really ties the room together, doesn't it, Colin? Today, our deepest apologies go out to Marcus Rust, CEO of Roseacre Farms. Sorry, Marcus. We just ran out of time for you. That's it. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you again soon on another episode of Legends and Losers. <laughs>